Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Lornhold, and I'm so happy you're tuning in today. I have been getting a number of questions about direct mail campaigns and their lack of effectiveness when it comes to probate mailings. Now, since COVID-19, you all know a lot of the courts shut down and some have since reopened, some have not. Some are uh, open for business, meaning that you can file the probates, but you cannot necessarily uh, get them through the system. They're, they're backlogged. They don't have enough um, people to take care of the backlog. So that that is one thing. But a bigger problem that I found um, that's come to light recently is that the list that the person is using is not always set up entirely correctly. In other words, you'll get your list from however you get it for your particular area. And maybe you're not taking enough time right from the get-go uh, to, to put together what I call a good list. So I'm going to go over some of the ways that I do this and see if that is helpful to you. So the, the number one thing is location. When, when we look up a property, and there's no shortcut for this, you have to look them up individually on the tax assessor site in my area. Some places that might be called the tax appraiser site, but here it's the tax assessor site. So the location must be right. It must be a place where I know that I'm interested in buying, or if it's a if it's still a good property, but maybe I don't want it, is it an area where a wholesaler or a rehabber could buy it from me? So do I have a, an investor buyer that would be interested in buying that property? So location is an immediate yes or no. Yes or no, I'm interested based on the location. Now, price, that's number two. This was the second thing that it can just cut, cut the whole thing off right here. If it's too expensive, it's going to be a house that's listed on the MLS, and I'm not going to be interested in high-priced homes. If the house is too cheap or in an area that I know is a war zone or a bad area or one that's going to be difficult to sell the property, then I'm going to pass on it. So we've looked, gotten the list and right here we've looked at the area and the price and that's either a yes or a no. And if I get a no on either one of those, then I don't go any further. So let's assume that I've gotten a yes on those two. The next thing I will look at is the square footage of the property. What is the size of the property? Because if it's under a thousand square feet, it's going to be really difficult to sell to anyone. Now, depending on where you live, that, that number might actually be a little bit higher. If it's not big enough for a family and that square footage, you will have to determine that for yourself. But it needs to be the correct size. It cannot be, um, for me, a house that is seven <clears throat> or 800 square feet. They're just simply too hard to sell and your pool of buyers is too small. The exception would be that if there is area uh, that can be finished, maybe it's a Cape Cod and there's an upstairs area or there's a basement that has at least the potential to be a walkout and to be counted as actual living space. So that's the third one. Now, some people say at this point, I, I wanna know if the house is listed. I don't necessarily look for that. While you can have someone go through and check and see if every property is listed, in most cases, um, it's I'll go ahead and mail to them anyway, and here's why. Because as the market starts to, ch to shift, to change, I will go ahead and, mar and mail to them because a lot of those houses simply will not sell. Going forward into 2021, you're going to find that a lot. As the market corrects, even if it's listed, they may be asking the price that they could get in mid 2020 or even here in the last quarter of 2020. That doesn't mean they're going to get that price next year. Back in 2008, I bought a ton of houses that were listed on the MLS 
after they didn't sell. So that's a decision you have to make. It's also a decision you have to make if you want to look them up or have someone look them up on the MLS and see if they're listed. I didn't do that because it was another thing that slowed the process down. So that would be number four. Number five, and this is a big one for some people, for other people, they don't care. Is the house what is considered functionally obsolete? And for some people that is a trial level or a buy level. If they're looking for a retail sale, uh, they may not be interested in that type of a property. A shotgun house, one that's got the room straight back. You Only you can answer that question in your area. The point I'm getting at here is as you start to stack up these things that make the house less desirable, it's going to be harder to sell. Whether you're rehabbing it and you want to sell it to a retail buyer or whether you are going to wholesale it. Now, if you're going to hold the property for a rental, I still encourage you to think long term. Think about uh, all the possible scenarios when you're building your, your list. And this is for probates, but it's also for any kind of a list. Now, if you think you might wholesale this probate property, then you're going to have to ask yourself, is, are these in, is this property in an area where my wholesalers like, like to buy? If it's not, if you're going to have trouble finding a buyer, then I wouldn't buy the house. You want to pick properties that are going to be easy to sell. So as I'm putting my list together, I'm thinking through all of these possible scenarios. Now, you, you may say this is a great area and I don't have anybody on my list that I can think of that would buy in this exact area, but it's a great area. So I'll go ahead and and put the house under contract, you know, if I get it in, and then I will know, you know, I will just find a buyer. So again, we're putting together a list with uh, future casting, what we're going to do with the house and all the possible scenarios. Now, here's another big one as the market gets ready to change. If I purchase this house or if someone purchases this house, Will the house cash flow if they're not able to sell it? So I want you to look down the road, six months, eight months, nine months. Let's say that you, you're looking to build your list and you have a property and you say, well, it's not one that I want because it's not in an area where I want to be. Okay, so who do I know that would buy this property? Well, I know this person who would buy the property. The next question you should ask yourself is, Given the level of repairs needed and the after repaired value, will this house cash flow if the investor gets stuck holding it? What if it doesn't sell? So you need to ask that question. And last but not least, as you're putting your list together, you need to scrub your list periodically, ideally every couple of months, but that's hard to do unless you've got someone dedicated to doing that job. But you need to scrub your property, uh, your list for properties that have sold. So if you take the time up front, yes, it does take longer to do this, but you put together a list with um, today, with today in mind, but also with uh, the market down the road in mind, you will have a, a much tighter list and you will have better results with that list. So let's go through it one more time. Location, yes or no. This is, this is a big one. Is it in a place where I would buy, where I feel comfortable buying and where I can sell it easily if I don't want to keep it? Price. Is this at or around the median home price? Maybe a little above if that's where you work, maybe a little below, but not twice as much as the average home price in your area. They're too hard to, to sell and especially in this market. When, when the market does correct and it will correct, you're, you may find that you're stuck with some properties if you if you bought higher end properties. But same is same is true for low end properties. Traditionally, when the market changes, a lot of the low end properties their values go down. So be very mindful of how much you uh, should or you're willing to pay for the property. The size of the house is the size adequate for um, a family or uh, you know is it 
is it not too small to be considered acceptable? Um, decide if, it, if it's listed is important to you. Is it an issue if you buy houses that are considered functionally obsolete, ones that they don't build anymore, like tri-levels and some bi-levels? Will it cash flow if you have to hold it or someone else has to hold it? If they re renovate the house, they do a, maybe a full gut rehab, will that house a cash flow if they can't sell it six months from now? And then, um, you know, like I said, periodically scrub your list for sold properties. Go back and look at the properties. And when you get return mail, here's, here's another tip for you. Open each and every one of those letters. Most people throw that direct mail away. They are, they put it in a big stock over here and they're going to get to it someday. Well, if you are the person who um, goes through that direct mail, there's gold in that mail because if you're getting the mail back, everybody else is getting the same direct mail back. So open it up and go through this process again. Before I spend money skip tracing this property, do I want it? Is it in the right location? Is it the right size? Is it a price that I would, uh, is it the right price for me? So go through the same scenario. And if you can answer yes to these questions and it's still a viable lead, then spend the money and skip trace it. You will get so many deals by doing that. So I hope this helps uh, with some of the challenges that you're having with, with your mailings. And in particular, the question was about probate mailings, but this applies to any off-market deals that you, you might uh, choose to, to work in. So this is Sharon Bornholt. I'll see you same time, same place next week. Bye for now.